Uh, tonight we continue with uh, the series in regard to religious spirits, and uh, there will be two uh, teachings uh, this week and next week on the spirit of the Corinthians. Um, and uh, God is beginning to open up some things that uh, each time I've taught on this several times before, but each time I teach on it, God seems to open up a little bit more. So turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. Let me just give you a general definition of this spirit first before I start reading from 1 Corinthians. And I take this definition from the scriptures. And as we go along, I think you will see uh, uh, the definition kind of being uh, spread out uh, as scriptures delineated and define it. It's a, a spirit of intellectualism, especially intellectual arrogance. Uh, all of these spirit, religious spirits promote pride, different types of pride. Uh, they all bring different types of fear. Uh, but this spirit uh, is especially operative in denominations, in religious denominations. In fact, this spirit is probably the most prominent spirit that operates right at the top of the denominational structures. Uh, no matter whether you the Catholic, uh, Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, you name the denomination, Methodist, whatever denomination, this spirit is, is very, very powerful. And it works with, because the Lord showed me one time that every church, there's a Baptist spirit, there's a Methodist spirit, there's a Presbyterian spirit, there's a Catholic spirit. Uh, these are not the Holy Spirit. No. But they are assigned to denominations. But above those denominational spirits is the spirit of the Corinthians, which because of the promotion of pride, and especially pride, and pride in your own denomination, and pride in what you have come to understand through your own denominational teaching, causes divisions, and causes people to be more proud of, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Baptist, than I am in Christ, and I am of Christ. So that, you get competition. You get, uh, the Spirit promotes uh, uh, trying to build your church at the expense of other churches. Yeah. You see, what God wants, what God wants, is we reach out to the lost, not try to take the sheep from some other fold that are already Christ's. Try to, to advertise our church, our programs, our whatever we can attract other people. A lot of people denominationally hop from one place to another and show and shop, so to speak. Uh, and this spirit promotes that, too. But it promotes d division, and as it promotes division, then there is opportunity for men in the leadership of, that, of those denominations to begin to introduce their own unique thing that is Presbyterian or Methodist, or, but not of Christ directly. And it causes an opening to bring compromise, and the teachings of men, especially the denominational leaders, to, to get that infiltrated into the church so that the people hear more of what the Methodists say, or the Baptists say, or the Presbyterians say, rather than just what the Word alone says. And the unique historical doctrines of a particular denomination are emphasized rather than the entire Scripture, all of what the Scripture teaches. And to believe that if you're a member of this denomination, that you at least are assured of heaven. Well, that's not so, because there is no membership in any denomination or any church organization that will assure you of a place in heaven. Then finally, finally, and we will see more of this next teaching, once you get the 
compromise introduced in the denominational structure, then you begin to allow corruption and sin and immorality to creep into the church denominations inside the church. So that's a long definition, but that's the spirit of the Corinthians. So let's begin to look at it uh, in the scripture, and we will spend most of our time in Corinthians, because after all, this is the spirit of the Corinthians. And I remind you, by the way, that this religious spirit does not just attack liberal churches that don't believe the word of God. This Corinthian church had people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so, this, 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 uh, this religious spirit attacks all churches Absolutely. of every stripe, and if it, can, if, if it can lead people into total compromise and outside the body of Christ, fine, but if they're still inside the body of Christ, if it can confuse or, or, or bring division or, or, or bring uh, where uh, the power of God can be limited, this is another major purpose of all these religious spirits, is to limit the power of God, to limit the release of the power of God. Because Paul said, I want your faith to be based on the power of God. Not doctrine, but on the power of God. Let's begin to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship, koinonia. By the way, when the communion is given, that word is used in 1 Corinthians 11. When you take the bread and the wine, you are by faith coming to receive his blood and his body. The Catholic Church teaches transubstantiation. It's the actual blood and body. I believe that first, or that John chapter 6 indicates that it isn't the actual blood and body in a fleshly sense, but in the spiritual sense by faith, we do receive the blood and the body. And we partake of Christ, and that's koinonia fellowship. It's come, another word here would be to know, to experience. So, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship. Into, and this is the Christian life into fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Not fellowship in a denominational structure, but fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, where His life has come into you, and that life is in you, and then you allow that life to flow through you to touch other people who are brought into that life, to be healed, to be delivered, to be saved, to be filled with the Spirit. Only the life, as we've said several times in this series, uh, Christianity is not mainly a group, a, a doctrine that is to be intellectualized and accepted in an intellectual sense, although yes, we are to accept it intellectually, but even accepting it intellectually doesn't mean you will experience it, doesn't mean you will experience the life. And so we must experience that life. And all religious spirits will try to get people into thinking that what they believe in their mind and give intellectual assent to is the key to the Christian faith. But it is not so. It is only experiencing the life of Christ through the anointing of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit brings the life of the Father and the life of the Son into us and to flow through us to touch other people with life. And so it is his life that we must experience. Now Paul says, I exhort you, brethren. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the Corinthian Christians. I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you but you'll be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, I'm coming back to that same mind. You see, denominationalism promote, promotes the idea that we Presbyterians believe this, we Methodists believe this, we Baptists believe this, we Catholics believe this. It promotes a division of doctrine based on the ideas that we accept in that doctrine. But Paul says, I don't want these divisions. These are not of the Holy Spirit. Now, God allowed denominations. God allowed denominations. And God has poured His Spirit through these various churches. So I'm not here to, to tell you that, that God has not moved through the denominational structure. He has. But it is clear if you, and I don't have time to go back to Ezekiel uh, chapter 10. 
it is clear in the prophecy there and in the prophecy in Isaiah that what is coming is a movement out of denominationalism back into that place where there is total unity in the life of Christ and where there is no longer that kind of division because this spirit of the Corinthians promotes denominationalism, promotes division, and promotes those things which limit the power of God to flow through the church into us and through us to other people who need that life. You must be made complete. Now, complete is, is another word for perfect. Be, be, be perfect. Now, to be perfect in the Bible doesn't mean that we come to the place where we enter into the Holy Spirit where we cannot sin. There is no experience that, that makes us where we cannot sin. But we can come into that place where if we walk by faith, and continue in faith from faith to faith, Paul says. If we continue in faith in all things, if we walk in faith each day, I don't have to sin today. I don't have to sin tomorrow. I don't have to sin this hour. If I continue to walk in faith, anything that is not of faith is sin. And so if I find I am not walking in faith, I repent and be brought back. But to be made complete is also to be brought together in a unity and in a harmony. And do you know that individually you can't be made complete just between you and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? There is a corporate, this is what we in America don't emphasize, there is a corporate unity. There is a drawing together of the entire body of Christ, all of the individuals who are in the Spirit, to be drawn together into a unity only in the Holy Spirit. And so any division, any division, any having a different mind. Now I'm going to wait till I come to Philippians. I'm going to come to Philippians chapter 3 in a few minutes where we talk about what it means or more of what it means to be of the same mind. It doesn't mean we'll have the same opinion about everything, but we'll have a certain mindset and a certain attitude that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And that mindset that comes from the Holy Spirit of God will not be proud, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian. There will be not any, any pride in that. No. I remember growing up in the Methodist church. Uh, we didn't sing it much, but I, 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 I knew the song. I'm a Methodist, a Methodist, a Methodist, a Methodist, a Methodist, till I die. You know, I mean, there, there is, a, there is a, an emphasis, there was in the early, in the early days. There was an emphasis on those kind of things that really kind of were prideful of a particular denomination. And God doesn't want that. I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by those people, that there are quarrels among you. No, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of a Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. These are like denominations, see. And so, what does Paul say about that? Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized of none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And no man should say to you, you're baptized in my name. And so, God wants you to understand that he doesn't want denominations. You know First Timothy 3, but I want to quote it because it, all religious spirits will play on this, but the spirit of the Corinthians will especially play on this. And let me go back to First Timothy, or Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy, and chapter 3 and verse 1. I realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now I believe, well, John says that we've he, we entered into the last days in his time. Yeah. So if we entered into the last days in John's time, we must be in the latter part of the latter part of the, <laughs> of the final week or the final day of the final hours yeah. in eternal terms. For men will be lovers. Now, this, this list, I used to think of this list <laughs> as a list of things that were, would be happening to pagans outside the church. But the Lord has spoken to me 
And today, again, made it even clearer to me that these things will not be just things that will be characteristic of the pagan world, but will be characteristic of people who call themselves Christians and are church members. Absolutely. Listen to the list. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, arrogance, pride, arrogance and pride in, in, in our knowledge of, of, of doctrine, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips. See, prayer meetings can turn into gossip sessions unless we are led by the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, really, uh, uh, we ought to be able to share in a Christian prayer meeting the deepest, most inner, personal things for others to pray. But unfortunately, uh, that uh, is a dangerous thing to do in the average church prayer meeting. Uh, now, we have tried to make this place a safe place and I believe, as I stand before the Lord, I believe that this is a safe place for people to confess. And that we can confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that we might be healed. Because God wants us to confess our faults. He doesn't want just to confess. In fact, I believe that we ought to be confessing our faults more than we confess those things which we think God has done through us or in us. It's all right to boast in what Jesus has done through us. But I think we need to be confessing one to another more often. Yeah. Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And here's the key. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied it po its power, avoid such men as this. Mm. Now, holding to a form of godliness, the church, the spirit of the Corinthians, promotes a denominational type of Christianity which promotes a form of godliness. Every Every denomination has a different form and ritual. Yes. But that form and ritual often become the essence of that church. Mm -hmm. And form and ritual are all right as long as you realize that form and ritual are meant as symbols of the reality of the actual life of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit whether communion or baptism or whatever form of ritual, and those two are the most important, I suppose, in church history, but those two can become mere form and ritual if we do not realize. We need to be careful when we take the communion to examine ourselves and to realize what God is saying through the communion. So here's a form of godliness and power that is this uh, spirit of the Corinthians is promoting. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians and go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4, and, uh, and let's read uh, verses 6 and 7, and then we'll skip to verse 18, or ignore verse 15. Verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake. Now remember, he had said, he had said, you call yourself of Apollos, you call yourself of, Ephes uh, of Cephas, you call yourself of Paul, is, is Christ divided? See, by, by, by the very first chapter of Corinthians, it's clear that any denominational ism involves flesh because Christ is not divided. Now, God allowed in history the denomination to operate for a period of time because I think what happened, and I don't have time to go back now to, I've, I've talked about this in another teaching, but the, the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans and how it penetrated the New Testament church and how that doctrine uh, uh, brought uh, the Roman Catholic Church first uh, and then the other denominations, even after the Reformation, other denominations to have their own structure but have a professional <laughs> clergy and have a professional control over the people. See, God never meant, that's one of the problems with denominations. They promote professional clergy to have control over the movement of God and dictate that control or allow that control to flow through them to the, to the so-called layman. Uh -huh. there, is no, there is no term for layman in the, church, in the Bible. We are all meant to be priests. See, we're all meant to be priests. That's why all of denominationalism was a, a hindrance from the very beginning to the fullness of what Christ wanted to accomplish. But he allowed it to, to occur. He's now bringing it to an end. 
He's now bringing it to an end gradually. It doesn't mean that all of the people in this denomination or that denomination are condemned at all. It just means all, everyone in every denomination will have an opportunity to come into the fullness of the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God and then bring a unity and a harmony that will have nothing to do with denominations, nothing to do with nations, nothing to do with races, nothing to do with color, nothing to do with, with uh, uh, any division. See, God hates divisions. And denominations have brought divisions. Now, see, in that context, listen to verse 6. I figuratively applied to myself and Apollo for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written. There's the key. It isn't what Apollos said. It isn't what Paul said. It isn't what anyone says. What is written in the Word? Jesus is the Word, become flesh. What is written in the Word? In order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Oh, I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Well, I believe this doctrine. I believe, I believe Wesley had it much better than, than, uh, than Calvin. Well, I believe Luther had it a lot better than... You see, it leads to division and it leads to arrogance and pride where we ought to be proud of nothing but the cross of Christ and Christ the living word. Verse 7, For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Yeah. I mean, we, we, if we have any ability, see, God gives us natural gifts. I'm born with certain gifts. You're born with, everyone's born with certain gifts. And not the same. Uh, some people are five talented, some people are ten talented, some people are two talented. But the great thing is that in the Spirit, when we come in the Spirit to receive Christ and receive the baptizing power of the Holy Spirit, we can receive supernatural gifts that by faith will flow through every single person, Amen. regardless of your natural gifts. And so Paul wants us, the Scripture teaches us, that we shouldn't boast about anything we have received I mean, I, I remember when I first was involved in the, in the charismatic renewal. Uh, there was a, almost a boasting attitude. Well, I don't know whether you're going to believe in faith, but boy, I'm going to believe in faith. If you're not going to receive it, I'm going to receive it. As if I am the source yeah. of having great faith. Uh -huh. No, I am not the source, and you are not the source of great faith. Faith is a gift. And Jesus wants to give it to you. But you have to read the Word. You have to pray. You have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Then you understand it. Then you act on it, and God's power will move. Verse 18. Some of you have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. And by the way, when Paul says, I'm not coming to you, he means Christ in him. Christ in him. And... I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. Oh my. Now, there's the key, people. Yeah, there, will fail. there is the key. That, will fail. that is the key. Yeah. Is someone... You see, if you are arrogant, earthly power may be flowing through you, but heavenly power will not be flowing through you. Amen. You must be taking the cross. You must be proud of nothing but the cross of Christ. That's the only way that resurrection life, if you come to the cross, is the only way that resurrection life is going to be flowing through you. And so, if the power of God, this is the power of God, not the power of man, not the power of the world, but the power of God, yeah. not what people say, not what they say they believe, what they are proud of in what they believe or what they, what they have come to know, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Glory to God. Amen. You shall receive power, Acts 1.8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be, really, martyrs. We translate it witnesses. You shall be <laughs> martyrs. Mm -hmm. Were the disciples martyrs yep. when they first said they wouldn't deny Christ, Peter and all the rest? Okay. No, but when they got baptized in the Holy Spirit they became martyrs. Yeah. Paul was crucified. Yeah. 
and all of the other apostles. Judas wasn't. John was boiled in oil but survived miraculously. So, what do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with a love or a spirit of gentleness? Now, I quote these often, but let me quote them for you once more. Because power, the power of God, is the key to the true church. The release of the power of God in your life and flowing through your life to touch other people's life and the spirit of the Corinthians promoting denominationalism will promote a form of godliness denying the power. Denying the power. Now, Revelation 12, 10 and 11, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them day and night before our God. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. There's the cross again. Notice tonight how many times we'll come to the cross. The key to the cross, I'll read something more about that when I come to what Paul says later in Corinthians. But the key to the release of the power of God is to understand the cross because the great weapons against Satan to overcome him are the blood, the word, and they love not their lives unto the death. And that means taking the cross. But notice, often I've mentioned this, but you can't mention it too often. Those four words that I just quoted. The last one quoted is authority. And I think it's quoted last because that's where we have to begin to take authority. Jesus, if we are one with him, he has, he has been given all authority by the Father over all the power of the enemy. And if we are one with him, he is our head and we are a part of him and we are given authority. That's delegated power from God. And when we, through the word of God in our hearts, take authority, God releases that power. When we come to the end of ourselves taking the cross, God releases that power. That brings the fullness of salvation. Salvation means to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be saved spiritually. It means all those things. That brings the kingdom. That brings the kingdom. Luke 10, 18 and 19. I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing indeed shall injure you. Man, I quote that a lot. And when I get under attack by the enemy, and the enemy comes against me spiritually or physically, and is attacking my body or attacking my mind. Uh, you know, I quote that and I just say, Satan, in Jesus' name, none of your demon powers will injure me. Nothing indeed shall injure me as I take authority under the anointing of the Spirit of God. The power of God will flow. I may have to go through something temporarily. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen. We don't, we are not affliction free, but we are are victors if we will believe. Amen. Praise. Now yeah. turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1.17. 1 Corinthians 1.17. And I'm going to read quite a bit of, of chapter 1 and uh, some of chapter 2 here because uh, uh, Paul uh, gives us, uh, I think, a key. Um, verse 18 or 17. Uh, for Corinthians 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, that the cross of Christ should not be, not be made void. Now, the cross is the key. The cross is the key. The cross is the key. The cross was the key in Jesus' life. It is the only way that Satan was defeated. And the only way to defeat religious spirits and the spirit of the Corinthians and denominationalism is to learn what it means to take the cross. Um, I have been attending churches since I was saved 
Well, no, before that, I was attending churches. I was attending churches from the time I was a child, long before I was saved. And mainly Methodist churches, or since uh, 1988 or 9, uh, uh, a lot of independent churches. I never have heard much preaching or teaching about taking the cross. You know, in all the years, and I don't mean to malign Asbury College, I love Asbury, and Asbury is a wonderful place. But in all of the years, 35 years, about the only teaching that I have heard uh, from the pulpit is the teaching of total surrender in relation to the cross. Now, that is certainly true. I must totally surrender. But the scripture is full of what it means to take the cross. And the cross is the key. For the word the cross, see this is the key to the power. See the resurrection comes after the cross. The new life power comes after the cross. They're, they're together, you can't separate them. I've heard, I've heard, I remember early days, I heard a charismatic teacher said there's too much cross religion preached. You can't preach too much of the cross. No. But there's an in intimate connection between the release of the power of God and taking the cross because that's how the power of God, the resurrection power of God was released until the, the dead came out of, uh, out of the ground when Jesus was raised in resurrection power, defeating death and defeating all that Satan did and had done and could do. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God being saved that's the, that's the Greek word sozo, and that means, saved means to be healed, to be delivered, to be saved spiritually, to be filled with the Spirit. It means all of those things. So that, and they, none of them can occur without the release of the power of God. But none of the power of God could have been released until Jesus took the cross. Because Jesus was manifested to destroy the power of the devil, so that the power of the devil could not interfere with the power of God. And you have to come to that place in your own life. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And, and by the way, here's another thing about the Corinthian spirit, promoting wisdom, <coughs> promoting man's wisdom, promoting worldly wisdom, bringing worldly wisdom inside the denominations in the church. How much worldly wisdom has been added? You look at the average, uh, well, look at the National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches. How much is biblical and how much is from the wisdom of the world? Would we be debating, or should we even be debating, the, 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 the ordination of homosexuals? I mean, there ought not to be any question. It has to be the wisdom of the world that's been added that it should even be debated. And you could, you, could, uh, you could list all kinds of things that we debate today inside the church denominations that have nothing to do with except to the wisdom of the world. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, the wisdom of the world is going to stop to the degree we write on our own er 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 earthly wisdom, only our own intellectual wisdom, and, and wisdom that comes as a part of this world is the degree to which we stop the flow of the power of God. And the degree to which we rely on God's wisdom and God's knowledge from the Word of God is the degree to which we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to flow. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message priest to save those who believe. For indeed the Jews seek for signs, the Greeks seek for wisdom. The Jews want some kind of miracle. The Greeks want some new, some new doctrine. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greece, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. And so the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the word, the wisdom of God in us, acted on, will release the power of God in us. Uh, here's another way we can understand uh, what Paul is talking about in relation to the cross. It's in Philippians, and it's in chapter 3. So let me turn to uh, Philippians, and uh, 
look at chapter 3 because Paul talks about the um, release of the power of God in chapter 3 of, of uh, Philippians. And here, 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 is the, here is an attitude that, and see, denominationalism and the spirit of the Corinthians will, will, will come against this attitude. God, God wants us to have an attitude that only the Holy Spirit can produce in us. The Bible says we should be of one mind. And that doesn't mean that, and part of taking the cross is allowing the Holy Spirit to produce a unity of mind uh, so that we have a certain mindset the Holy Spirit produces in us. And here's how Paul puts it in Philippians 3, verse 7. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And when I read that, I, 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 I realize that even in my own life, that, that although this is something that, that that, that I have sought for and, and, and asked Christ for, there are many times when I allow the, the, the things of the world to, to so that I am, I am not uh, uh, seeking the way God wants me to, to consider everything of the world as rubbish. And the only thing that, that, that I can know that is of any importance is to know Christ Jesus and be found in him, be continually found in him. I see, I see in my life, uh, I, I see so many places where, where I am going off on this tangent and this tangent, not seeking continually to be found in Him, to be one with Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God wants me to do everything I do daily by faith, and I fail. I, 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 I forget that God wants me, everything I do, He wants me to do by faith. I mean, He wants me to mow the lawn by faith, and I don't usually. I have learned to teach by faith. I've even learned to grade papers by faith. But I mean, I, I, I mean to, to, to all of those things which, which we, we can do in, in our own strength, but God wants to make us understand that we could wake up one day and we couldn't think a thought, we couldn't see, we couldn't hear, we couldn't walk, we couldn't talk, we couldn't do anything every, every day that God allows us to live and walk and talk and is, is, is a gift. It is it is something that God wants us to praise Him for. To be found in Him. A right standing with God only on faith that I may know Him. And the power of His resurrection. And the fellowship of His sufferings. Notice. The power of His resurrection. The power of God is not going to be flowing through us unless we come to know the fellowship of his sufferings. The scripture says the godly shall suffer persecution. The scripture says Jesus was perfected through the things which he suffered. This doesn't mean that we seek suffering, but it will come. It's the part of life. It will come. How do we deal with it? Do we consider everything that happens to us as a gift from God? Even the tragic things that seem to make no sense. And in human terms, many things make no sense. I remember Whitaker Chambers, who was converted to Christ late in life and a former communist. And he said many communists uh, became atheists because they couldn't put together all of the tragedy and suffering in, 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 let's say, in Russian history or in their lives was a good God. 
How could there be a good God that controlled and all the tragedy and suffering? But he says, if you understand this, if you understand that the most tragic thing that ever happened in all of history was that Jesus himself, the divine Son of God, divine Holy God himself, was crucified. And that out of it, Satan was defeated. And resurrection life was released. So that if we understand, if we want to know him, we're going to have to not just seek the power of his resurrection, we're going to have to seek the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it, or I've already become perfect, one, completed, but I press on in order that I lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. This is the attitude. We must, we must allow God through the Holy Spirit if we are to overcome this religious spirit of the Corinthians and denominationalism and have power flow through us, we are going to have to be determined and, and with our will, our will, our will set that we are going to appropriate everything that God appropriated us for when he saved us and filled us with the Spirit, that we have a passion and a determination that we will pray and we will seek the word to know everything that God has for us. Once he appropriated and took us and we received that, then we seek to appropriate every purpose for which he has appropriated us and taken us. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a determination of the will. It isn't just when you receive Christ or when you're baptized in the Spirit, it's a continual day-by-day -day attitude. And, you see, it's this, kind of, of, it's this kind of attitude that this spirit of the Corinthians destroys because you can get comfortable inside a church denomination. You go to church, you're on a committee, you're active doing this, you're active doing that, and, and somehow we get comfortable and somehow we don't realize, in fact, it's incredible to me. When I look at the New Testament and I see what the New Testament teaches, how much of what is taught, it's as if it isn't in the scriptures. It's not preached. It's not taught. It's not, I mean, you listen to sermons and preachers, will repeat each other on, 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 on sermons, but it's only certain individuals. And you know when you hear it. You know when you hear it. When there's an anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, you will know that this is something deeper that God wants to take us into. And that's what he's saying. Brother, and I don't regard myself as having laid hold this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. See, that's why at my advanced stage, I, I, I am as young in the spirit as I ever was because I am looking forward. I am pressing on. I am not pressing backward. I am pressing on. And God wants you young, middle-aged. Oh, he wants you to press on. Reaching toward what lies ahead, I press on to the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this mind, have this attitude. And if anything has you had a different attitude, God will reveal it to you. It'll break down every barrier. It's a part of taking the cross. Now, let me quickly say something about 1 Corinthians 2 and 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and then we will be through for tonight's teaching. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul continues. Uh, and he continues to talk about this, what is needed to overcome the spirit of the Corinthians. And so I read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Uh, Paul had a very uh, uh, high degree of education. I always thought he had uh, maybe an equivalent of several PhDs, but whatever. He had a lot of education. I mean, he had studied, and he was very intelligent. But he was determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, the, the older I've gotten, the more longer I've taught. That's a long time now. In fact, if I would add up all of the teaching that I have done in every area and level, uh, I will soon conclude 45 years of teaching. And uh, that's a long time. <laughs> but I know that uh, what I have learned in the Word is so much greater than a Ph.D. education. Is so much higher, is so much greater, so far, 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 far beyond that it's like this is here's some little tiny little little thing, and here's a huge world of 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 knowledge and scripture. In fact, my own teaching of history has been totally, totally changed, totally changed by the word, by studying the word. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. In demonstration of the Spirit and power. See this religious spirit of the Corinthians will stop the demonstration of the Spirit, stop the flow of the power of God. You must recognize it and come against it and move in the Spirit, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God your faith to rest on the power of God. Now when we say the power of God, remember the power of God is only released as we take the cross. We've got to take the cross to come to the end of ourselves, else the, uh, every, 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 any ounce of my energy, of my fleshly energy, my soulish energy, if, 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 if I use any of that to serve God, the least bit of the energy of the flesh and the energy of the soulish in me will limit the power of God. And God wants you to demonstrate. That Jesus said one time, if you don't believe me, believe me for my work's sake. This is in John, I think chapter 10. Believe me for my work's sake. Oh, well, you know, they, they, they couldn't answer that. We ought to be able to say to people, you know, if you don't believe what I'm saying, just, just follow and we will pray and God will demonstrate His truth. The Lord told me when I started teaching the Word, I don't know, 30 years ago at least, maybe longer, Son, I don't want you to teach the Word without demonstration of the Word. I don't want you to teach the Word without demonstration of the Word. That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. Wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery. In a mystery. Now, what is a mystery? This is a great truth unknown to human reason and the human mind. A, a, a scriptural mystery. You, you, you're not going to know. You're not going to know. I don't care how intelligent you are, how much you study with your mind, you're not going to know. Now, Satan has his mysteries. And you have to enter into Satanism to learn these dark mysteries, and there's some power in that. Witchcraft, divination, sorcery, all of that is, is, is in the realm of mystery because with the human mind, you can't figure it out, but it, 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 there's a power there. But in the Holy Spirit, when you come to the Word and, and the release of that in the Holy Spirit, that releases the power of God. Yeah. And the power of God sets free, and the power of Satan brings bondage. Yeah. And the power of God's best based on the truth of the word, and the power of Satan is based on falsehood. So, again, verse 7, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. 
The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age understood, for they have understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Now, here's a key. This next passage is a key to the purpose for why you are saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is not just to titillate you, to make you feel good, or to give you some excitement of a new experience. The basic purpose of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit of God in you is that first you will be cleansed and you will be healed or delivered or whatever you need to be, but then the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit begins to flow through you so that you begin to understand things that are mystery that you could not understand by reading the Word alone, but the Holy Spirit will open up to you and you will begin to understand it. Listen, listen to what Paul says in verse 8. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this understood Verse 9, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. In other words, in, intellectually, what my physical eyes I can't see, and what my physical ears can't hear, hear, and what has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, you can't imagine. You, you could use your mind and you could study and study and study, and you can't imagine what God has prepared for you to receive, and for you to receive, not only to receive, but for you to understand so that, and understand it in the sense, in, in the two senses that I've spoken of before, not just with your mind, but you understand that what God has prepared is real, is already accomplished, and he wants you to enter into this to receive it, so that as you receive it, what God has promised will not just, you will just receive, but you will believe, and what he has said and his work in heaven will flow through you. And here's where supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit have to come in. I'll say more about that when I close, uh, about the work of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. But see, one of the basic works, one of the most important works, in fact, I think word knowledge, one of the supernatural gifts, word of knowledge. I think the key to a word of knowledge is a word of knowledge shows us those things which God has already provided for us. And suddenly, here's a word of knowledge, and the Lord says, uh, I've healed this person's uh, back. Well, we know from the Scripture that's true, but uh, when God says, when God gives you a word of knowledge, that someone has, has uh, uh, healed their back. That, that means that he wants them to receive that now. So a word of knowledge is knowledge about what God has provided, but he makes it now. That's what Peter and John had. And the man at the gate, beautiful. Uh, silver and gold have we none, but what so we have give I do. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. They didn't tell every cripple to rise up and walk. But they had a word from the Lord, and this is the purpose, not only a word of knowledge, but other supernatural gifts of the Spirit, so that, see, see this is why the Corinthian, the Corinthian spirit, the denominational spirit, will say, well, now, uh, this is a, this is the work. Well, some will say, like Calvin, well, there is no baptism in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't exist. Calvin said the only the only supernatural thing is to be saved. There's no supernatural deliverance. There's no supernatural. And then, uh, well, Luther ca came a little further, not much further. Uh, and uh, uh, Wesley at least did at least did believe in all the supernatural gifts. But you have all those various denominational teachers, and they will say, "Well, it's like the assembly of God. They believe in the supernatural gifts, but they will say, well, a Christian can't have uh, a demonic uh, influence in their life." Hmm. Well, I don't know. I've I've uh, I usually say to people, "Well, come with me and and, and see what you think." Yeah. <laughs> see. See what this, this Corinthian spirit does? It, it, it takes maybe a part, for it may deny all of the supernatural works of the spirit, or part of them, but it will try to mislead or stop the flow of the power of God. The purpose is to stop the flow of the power of God. That's the purpose of the, of the, of the spirit. And it promotes division. 
Now, verse 10, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the depths of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the depths of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, we are spirit, we are soul. The soul is the realm of the will, and the mind, the emotions, and we are body. And so, what Paul is teaching here is that the, the spirit, there, there are spirits, there are demonic spirits, and there's the Holy Spirit. And anything that has to do with eternal things, anything that has to do with eternal things, is either, either going to come from the Holy Spirit or demonic spirits. And so, that, that in our spirit, God wants us to rely on the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will make alive the truth of the Word of God so that we can, we can understand what God has provided and as God has provided it, we can receive it, not just in our minds, but in our hearts to realize, to realize in our hearts that what God has done. See, this is, this is, this is a place that I've failed more often than any other, I think, in ministry. Jesus never did fail here. Uh, the disciples, after they were baptized in the, in the Spirit, didn't fail. Um, I've prayed with people, a, a number of people, who were dying. I've seen a few who were, who were healed. I've seen many who died. And I, I, I think the problem, we recently had a, a case, just a, a woman in the Bethel Church has recently died, just, did, just today, I guess it was, died of cancer. And we prayed for her several times. But what, what I know we need more of is a direct revelation of the Holy Spirit of God how to apply because there's no question that, that the Word teaches that He's provided for physical healing or He's provided for deliverance. And yet, why is it? Why is it that uh, none of us, Jesus did it, and, and there have been a few people, but sometimes, I'll tell you, Ron, when, 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 I have, when I have been successful, when I've seen a divine miracle, it's when I have heard from God directly. And God has made alive so that I know in my spirit man what God is going to do before it happens. And, and God wants us, and, and you know, Bevington, G.C. Bevington, who I have mentioned many times in this meeting, uh, Remarkable Miracles is a book he wrote. He died in the 1920s. But he would pray one day, two days, three days, five days, ten days. He would fast and pray. And he would pray. He got in a log one time. He said, I'm going to stay in this log till I hear from God or die. We don't have that determination. We don't have that determination. But God wants us to come to the place where we come to the end of ourselves. We enter into this desire to, to, to take hold of Christ, to take hold of all that he has, and then we receive, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is of God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. See, the Holy Spirit is meant to show you what God has freely given you. Mm -hmm. And we can't really, in our mind, we read something in the scripture, we can't really believe that this is, this is for us now, today. We can't take that in. But God wants to show us that what he has spoken in the word and what he does in the word is something that he wants to see happen in our lives. My experience is that people who come from, the, from countries where there is not as much denominationalism and there's not as much knowledge, at least surface knowledge of the word. Uh, in Kazakhstan, I noticed that when I would share the Word of God, and these people many times had not known the Word of God, when you tell them that this is what God says, if you tell them, I had this happen, that God heals, you'll have a whole huge number of people come down to receive healing. If you tell them that God will baptize them in the Holy Spirit, 
I've had as many as 70, 80, uh, 100 people at one time to come down to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because there is a simplicity of, oh, God says, oh, is that what God says? To receive it. But you see, I, this, this Corinthian spirit, America, well, we've got this doctrine we've heard, and we've got this we've heard, and we've got this we've heard, and this person says this, and this person says this, and this denomination teaches this, and this denomination teaches this. And it limits the release of the power of God. Because God wants us, and one last principle here, I won't read it, but I'll give you the principle. In, in, in it, it indicates here at the end of Corinthians that we must give expression to divine impression. We must give expression to divine impression. Doesn't put it in those words. But see, what I've learned is this, and I don't have time tonight to talk about the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. But a lot of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, word of prophecy, are speaking gifts. Well, tongues and interpretation of tongues, speaking gifts. Or discerning of spirits. If you have something that comes about a spirit, a certain type of spirit, I've found that you have to speak that. You have to speak that. And so, God wants us to learn to speak on the basis of the Holy Spirit speaks to my spirit. Yeah. Not what my mind is telling me that can't be. Every deliverance, I mean, and, and here I'm talking about deliverance from actual demon power where demons have been within someone. Every, every, every time anything like that has occurred, and it's happened probably a dozen times in my life over the years, where someone is delivered from demon power, maybe, maybe a little more than that, but uh, my mind has said, you're crazy, Neff. This can't be. I mean, I remember one time a woman over in the, in the church we had over in Nicholasville, she was rolling on the floor, writhing, and a demon was, uh, demonic power was over her, and she was, you couldn't understand anything we was, she was saying, and so I just commanded in Jesus' name, uh, name yourself in Jesus' name, command you, you spirit, name your, you strong man, name yourself in Jesus' name. And I, all, 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 I mean, you couldn't understand a thing she was saying. I mean, it was just like gobbledygook. And I said, Lord, 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 come, come, help us, help us, help us. And the, I still remember I still remember the name. The Lord said, Seth. And my mind said, Neff, you're crazy. Where did you get that? that, that, that you just, you, that's just something popped into your head. It has nothing to do with. And so I kept praying, and the Lord kept speaking, Seth. And so finally, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan. I bind the spirit of Seth. command you to come out of her in the name of Jesus. And you should have seen her. I mean, bam, that mm. thing came out of her. And, and, see, I remember a, a Methodist lady who was in our de delegation. No, no, that was another time. That was another time. <laughs> we had a Methodist lady in our delegation when we had another deliverance, something like that, and she couldn't believe what, what was happening. But here's what, here's, here's, here's what I think God wants me to say to you in closing tonight. This, this Corinthian spirit promotes denominationalism, promotes pride, it, it promotes arrogance, it promotes compromise because men take over, and we must learn how to begin to move in the Spirit to release the power of God. And there is no way to release the power of God except taking a cross, and as we learn to take the cross and empty ourselves, make ourselves of no reputation, want to come opposite to the resurrection and the crucifixion of Christ, as Paul said. Then, when we come to that place where we are willing to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking to our spirit and give expression, because you will never know if something is within you, you will never know whether it's divine unless you give expression and speak it. And when you have God, when you speak what God has put there, power of God 
will be released. And that's the test. That's the test. Is the power of God released? And if it's of God, the power of God will heal, deliver, set free. Yeah. It's of the enemy, it will bring bondage. Praise God.